Now, the dust is yet to settle over the aftermath of the NSAS protest in Nigeria. More importantly is the unraveling of the victims of the protest who were either injured by the bullets of the soldiers or are still considered missing till date. Founder Foundation for Investigative Journalism, Chisayo Shoyombo, spent 10 weeks tracing the deaths, disappearances and injuries from the military inter in intervention in the Leki Tollgate protest of October 2020. He joins us now to shed more light on his findings. Good to have you, Fisayo. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's yeah. good to be here. Oh, the pleasure is ours. I'm reading some of your write-ups. Um, I wonder how you managed to stay optimistic in the face of... Um, I, I, there's one I made note of. There was a particular person, you, 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 I think it's Joshua Osai, who you said his two friends, after discovering that he was shot and, and what he suffered, then went out on social media to, to make their own opinions felt, and within two, three days of each other, we're, we're dead. Uh, how do you stay optimistic about your mission in the midst of all of this? Did you say, how, how do I stay optimistic? Because it's the only option we have. If, you, if we say as young people, we want a better country, uh, we, want, we don't like the way the country is run, we don't want a, a, a state where, where People can speak up. People can ask for something as basic as freedom from, from police brutality. Then we, we can't all run away. Some people have to stay back and, and do the job. You know, when we talk about change in this country, we young people like to lay all the blame at the doorstep of the politicians, the leaders. But we have to realize that everyone has a role to play. The journalist has something to do. The lawyer has something to do. Everyone has to get involved in the process of trying to make this country better. What I can do as a journalist is to seek the truth and give it out you know, to the public. Uh, uh, Fisayo, you spent 10 weeks tracing the deaths, the disappearances and injuries from the military intervention in the Lekki toll gate protest of October 20, 2020. Briefly walk us through what that journey was like, what you discovered the challenges you encountered and how you overcame them. I'm assuming that you have overcome them. Okay, first challenge is that majority of the victims are people at the base of the social ladder. People who didn't know where to go to, people who didn't have a voice. A lot of them not on Twitter, not on, not on Facebook. A lot of them don't even know the right things to do, who to talk to, whether they can be protected or not. So first was I had to look for them. Another challenge is that protesters just met. You know, they met in Lekki. If you want to look at the Zaria massacre, they are Shiites. They are people with a prior relationship. So it was easy for them to trace. But Lekki protests, someone from, you know, people from different places just came and they didn't know that that was going to happen. So tracing them was a hard job. Convincing them was tough. There were people that, that I spent as long as two months trying to convince trying to make them realize that you, you can't keep quiet. You can't keep quiet. If you don't want this to happen again, we have to speak up. Um, there were people who were threatened. If you, if you read part one of that story, there's a certain lady that was called. That was called. And the person told her, look, the punishment for sin is death. It took me a long time to convince her to talk, to release that audio to public. Because if you wrote that without that audio, people would say, oh, it's fake news. It was doctored. You, know, you heard the voice of the lady that was threatened. She had to move out of her house. So a lot of them, the first thing they think of is security. I've had people, I mean, part one is, one guy spoke to us and three weeks later he said, look, three people in my neighborhood have been picked up. I don't want to talk again. I want you to withdraw what, what, I, what I've said. So there is an atmosphere of fear among those people and it was such a tough job convincing them to speak. As a matter of fact, with time, the truth about what happened on October 20 will be revealed. There are people who are not journalists who have this information. There are doctors. You know, if you do your investigations there on the island, doctors in private hospitals, they know. You know, so somehow at, the truth just had to be said because what happened on October 20 has no place in a democracy. It shouldn't happen again. And we have to get to the root of it had to be said. Um, I want to find out from you two things, really. Um, one, have you, what kind of a response have you had so far since what you've put out in the public, both on social media and your write-ups? 
And then I know investigative journalists who have gone into hiding. They've had to actually flee the country since that event you documented. Why have you been targeted? And if not, why not? Okay, so first question again, please. So the first question is, what kind of a response have you had, whether from state or federal government or any organization in response to what you've put out in the media space? And also, have you been targeted? Because I know others who have and have fled the country as a result. If not, why not? Response, we tried to get the reaction of the state government before we went to press, and they didn't want to talk because the matter is before the panel. So I wasn't expecting any response from government afterwards. Um, as per responses from other people, I haven't really tracked. You know, my job really is not to put out stories and wait if people praise me or condemn me. My job is to put out the truth. And if I have, I really don't take the time to look at what the reaction is. I've done what I should do as a truth seeker. Whatever response happens in terms of how people receive the story, I don't worry too much about it. In terms of being targeted, at the moment, I haven't been targeted. I don't say things that haven't happened to me. I've not been targeted. People have fled the country, yes. But also, in the military era, some people stayed back and did journalism. Some people held the military to account. The democracy we enjoy today, it's not only because of people who protested, people who moved the motions for Nigeria's independence. It is also because some journalists stayed back when it was inconvenient, at risk to self, to their families, to their dignity, to their peace of mind. They stayed back and held the military government of those times to account. So everyone is not going to run away from this country. If you want a better country, it's so easy, I mean, not to disparage those who have, but everyone cannot run away. It's easier to say we want a better country. We have to show that we indeed want it, and we are ready for it, and we are ready to make sacrifices to make this country better. Let, let, let's talk about motive. Um, people have different motive, underlying motive for doing different things or what they do. Let's uh, zero in into what really is your underlying motive or what motivates you to do what you do? My background, I was born to a father who always told me I had to be honest in everything. Even if I was wrong, I had to, if, my, if I did something wrong, my dad wanted to, to give me six strokes of the cane. If I admitted it, he would give me two. I was brought up to always seek the truth, um, to always value integrity. And then I read animal science. I, I spent six years across two universities studying agriculture-related courses. And I decided, you know, after one year in campus journalism, I decided I was going to become a journalist because I saw journalism as a tool for speaking out for the voiceless, for trying to push for a better society. We did it on campus and we saw results. I'm like, okay, it would be nice to spend the rest of my life trying to work in a space that makes the society better. So it's, journalism for me is more than a job. It's more than trying to make a living. It's more than trying to earn a salary. It's a calling. You know, I had no business in journalism after six years. You know, if there are people who want to raise sheep, I can teach them how to do it on low budget. I can give them leaves of Lucina lycocephala, Enterolobium cyclocarpum, <laughs> Lyricidia sepium, mix it with cassava peels. I tell you what to do. That's what I spent six years studying. If I now decide to venture into journalism, it has to be for a reason. And my reason is to help make this society better. I'm not idealistic. I'm not saying the world is going to change overnight. You know, but I'm saying I want to, if it's a drop in the ocean, I we want to help. We can start somewhere. Yes, what you're start. saying, let's start somewhere. Let's do something. The Journal of a Thousand Miles, the Chinese people would say, begins with a step. Fisayo Soyombo, thank you so much. And we can only wish you the best. In this year, you were speaking agricultural language, and that was fantastic. Thank you so much.